it's important to consider that all real estate is architecture, regardless of what type of real estate it is, regardless of what the asset class is. Even self-storage is architecture, although a lot of architects might not love <laughs> the buildings, but it is still architecture. And there are a lot of aspects of all buildings being architecture that are critical to the success of each type of building in each type of asset class. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 398. How important is architecture and design when it comes to real estate investing? According to my guest today, it's of utmost importance. And the sooner you understand that, the more money you can make. Aaron Yassin is an award-winning design-driven developer building ground-up construction apartments in Brooklyn, New York. With over 20 years of experience in real estate, design, and fine art, he holds a unique position in the development space. Aaron's goal is to build the Tesla of houses. And today, we're going to find out what that actually means. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Brian. Terrific to be here. Let's just talk about design architecture because that's your background. Tell us what you mean when you talk about design and why that's so important in real estate investing. Let's start off thinking about real estate, right? So, you know, a lot of investors think about you know, real estate or something you've even used the RE for an abbreviation, right? But it's important to consider that all real estate is architecture, regardless of what type of real estate it is, regardless of what the asset class is. Even self storage is architecture, although a lot of architects might not love <laughs> the buildings, but it is still architecture. And there are a lot of aspects of all buildings being architecture that are critical to the success of each type of building in each type of asset class. And when you understand the kind of ins and outs, if I can use phrase it that way, of the actual architecture that you're dealing with, you can understand it on a, on a base level, which is just, you know, how the building functions, the mechanical systems, the operational systems, and then take it even to a much higher level and think about the design of the building itself and how that can impact the experience of the building those are you know there's and then there are layers in in between you know those two different aspects of the design of the architecture take us kind of through the 101 lesson here of like what are the basics of design that that affect a real estate investor and and then what are some of the more intricate parts of that that design that that can even have a, a bigger wider ranging effect so i'd like to break it down in into a, a list i've got five five points that that i like to use just to talk about it. and i'll give you these they're in in no or hierarchical order cuz they're all of critical importance and I'll, I'll just give you the list and then we can, can dig into each one just briefly. You've got planning, which includes a spatial planning, uh, materials, lighting and lighting systems, the building envelope, and then building systems. So just to dig into each one briefly, planning, it's kind of easy to understand. That That's thinking about, you think about floor plans, right? People talk about blueprints, which of course aren't blue anymore, but often when you think about those, those are floor plans. Of course, they include elevations and cross sections and things like that as well. But just thinking about the floor plans, that's part of planning. And then the spatial component of the planning are those other types of drawings, the, you know, the elevations and and the cross sections. And even when you're dealing with, let's say you're an operator and you do, you know, value add rehab, right? So you might go into an apartment or an apartment complex and you in thinking about the spatial planning of what you're already starting with is really a critical factor and how you can transform what you've got to where it could go 
Explain that. Like, get specific. How? How? What would you take into consideration if you're doing some sort of value add on an existing building? Okay, so first layout, right? There's a lot of a lot of buildings that were built in you know, people that are still occupied, 60s, 70s, 80s, where there are you know layout choices and preferences. One, they could just be different than they are now, or two, they just perhaps weren't done that well in the first place. The the apartments weren't divided in a way that was most advantageous. There were different decisions made about, you know, where certain walls are and, and the circulation of the space and then effectively how the space can be, you know, best utilized and experienced. So that's the that's the right place to start is to you know think about that. But then from there, of course, that's that's kind of a layout floor plan question. But space is three dimensional. So you want to think about it in relation to the, you know, the full spectrum of the space you're dealing with. What's the experience like when you open the apartment door? Is there a little vestibule there or do you open the door and you're immediately impacted by, you know, a very large, generous space that's that's full of light where you can, you know, see a, a new kitchen that's very inviting. It, it could go potentially actually either way. Sometimes a vestibule is nice. Sometimes that big and fat pack full experience is nice. So there's different decisions that can be made based on what the starting point is, things like that. And then, of course, you know, typically if you're doing full value add, you're going to change the windows, you're going to change the doors, you're going to change, you know, the fixtures. So all of those will also, you know, impact that spatial planning. And some of them, though, get into the next point on my list, which is materials. Before you get into materials, I have to share an example from a building that, that I own here with my investors in Grand Rapids. It's almost 100 years old. It's a seven story, like courtyard style brick building. And, and the way that it was designed in the interiors is that the, the supports are all vertical. There's like 14 vertical columns throughout the whole building that support the floors and everything. So other than the exterior walls, none of the, the walls on the interior are load bearing. So we can, we can remove walls wherever we want. And the other thing that's interesting about the design on that, and maybe you can compare like how it used to be done to how it is now, is that each kitchen has an exterior door to the hallway. And that's because back when they, they opened this building in the 1920s, they used to cook food down in, in the, there was a restaurant downstairs. They used to cook food and then servants or people, I don't know, servants, waiters, whatever, would bring the food up and put it in the ice chest. They didn't even have a refrigerator. I don't even think they had refrigerators. Not a hundred years ago, they wouldn't have had a refrigerator, right? They'd put it in the ice chest. They'd come in through the kitchen door, which is kind of like the servant's entrance, put it uh, put it in the ice chest and then leave through the kitchen door. So I, I thought that was really fascinating when we bought that building. But is that a good is that an example? Of that's a fantastic. And, and that's an example where, you know, how uh, of showing how we live in spaces now is just different than how we used to live in the functionality of those spaces. So those design specifically that that design decision was made because of a way in which people lived in those apartments at that time. And since it's not done now, you probably did you keep the doors or you wall them off? The doors are still there, but they're kind of like sealed shut forever. Right, right. So they're they're not of any use. I can give you, you know, kind of a similar example, you know, here in New York City, there's a lot of uh, buildings that are either, you know, three apartments over three in one building or four on either side, railroad style apartments. And, and some of these would be classified really kind of as your typical tenant tenement apartments. And in all of those apartments, the kitchens in generally the bathrooms are always in the back of the units. So you imagine you have a long, you know, railroad, you think of a railroad car and they're kind of proportioned like that. So you've got the kitchen in the bathroom in the back, and then they were split up into one room, two rooms, three rooms, sometimes even four rooms, and those interior rooms have no windows. So the, if possible, particularly if you're rent, got renovating the entire building, the ideal solution is to move the kitchens and the bathrooms to the middle of the apartment, open up the kitchen, right? So it's open to one side, and then you have an open kitchen living room with the windows on the back of the building, and then the bathroom doesn't need a window, and then you have you know bedroom in the front that also has windows, and then you have this nice railroad style layout that really reinvents the space so that that's a 
both of these are, are, are ways of thinking about spatial planning just in simple context. But there are that's an easy one to figure out. There are many more complex challenges, particularly when dealing with buildings from, let's say, the, the 70s and 80s. You're also building new construction too, right? Or are you? Yes, all, all new construction. So when it comes to design, what are what's the current way of thinking? Is it is it more like you want to have window space and let's we don't need the windows for the bathrooms and the and the the kitchens? I mean, what's what's the current? Yes, well, definitely in in the space that we're working in, in in Brooklyn, you know, you obviously have buildings that are are typically up to the lot line on either side and often adjacent to other properties. So you can't get side windows. Occasionally there is opportunity to get side windows. So considering you're likely just to get windows on the front and the back, you're going to want to have bathrooms in the, you know, your the core circulation and bathrooms in the center because they don't need windows. Of course, bathrooms are with windows are fantastic. I particularly love a window in a shower or a skylight over a shower, but so it's just not possible. But you want to then leave the space available that you have on the front and rear of the building for windows. And, you know, typically I, I tend to gravitate toward, you know, larger windows with larger, larger panes, which again, you know, you think about possibilities historically, a hundred years ago, you couldn't have the same size window that you have now. So you can really open up the space that way and, you know, bring a lot of light in, even if the space is, is potentially deep because of the, the site you're working with. Again, here in the city, if you're building single family, well, I mean, then it's a, you know, you, your full range of options is available, right? You can decide where everything is. And, it, and to some degree, it's actually, it's a, it's a, it's, you have more creative freedom, but then that gives you more options and can be more difficult depending on, you know, what you're thinking about building when you're starting fresh with a single family construction. Please continue with your, your list there. Second point, materials, materials, right? Significantly inform the quality of design. And, you know, I like to think about these things too, that, you know, you have simple materials, right? A painted wall, you know, paint is a material and it counts as a material. And of course, there's a lot of different grades of paint that you can get. And they look and feel very different. They reflect light very differently. So I would advise anyone to really consider carefully the kind of paint that they're using. And then, you know, also you can think about color and how that informs the space. So let me, let me stop you. So you would advise, think carefully about the kind of paint you're using. What what would you advise against and what would you uh, urge someone to, to lean to? Right now, the first thing I would advise is to use paint that has no VOCs in it because you can get it and it's not bad. Benjamin Moore makes it. So that's from a VOCs are volatile organic, organic compounds. compounds, right? Not not great for you. you can, the toxic scent smell that comes from paint. Exactly. And you can use the the this paint now and you don't smell it. You could sleep in the same room with, you know, within hours of, of, of painting. But the difference in paint is extraordinary. You get very cheap paint. It looks like very cheap paint. If you get very more expensive paint. It's typically, I mean, I'm using dollars and cents, but it's not always dollars and cents. There's a range, you know, from the kind of fifty to hundred dollar price point per gallon, where you know maybe one's not necessarily that much better than the other. It's just different different brands, but clearly they're all better than the twenty dollar gallon of paint. It's the it's the pigment, the type of pigment in the filler and the medium that's in the can, and it will dramatically affect you know the look and feel of the wall that you have. And there are, of course, some much higher levels of paint. And if you paint a wall with those and you do it properly, which is going to involve multiple coats of, of the same paint, the light's really penetrating through it and it comes off the wall. It just, it, it feels so much different. You like the Benjamin Moore non-VOC paint? Yes. Well, as a starting point, that's something that, that's accessible to people also. And I, I do like Ben Moore paint. They make a pretty good paint. The Aura line, I think there's a non-VOC Aura. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will 
save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property manager interested in applying Green Property Management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. Please continue. There's lots of different materials that, that you can think about. And of course, the materials also go back into informing the first point, which is, you know, the, the spatial planning, because the way materials look and feel affect how, how the space looks and feels. So I, I mentioned materials to emphasize that it's important to think about exactly which materials you're using and how they relate to each other. So a proper way of really making these assessments is when you're working on a project, you know, get some samples of a variety of materials and make what, you know, kind of in the industry terminology is a kind of a mood board where you take small samples of the materials and you arrange them together and see how they look and feel on a small scale. And then you can, you know, replace things, change them out and see if you get something that feels better. And then if you really want to take it to the next level, I mean, some paint manufacturers too that are now selling small cans of paint just so you can Test of all, you get a bigger surface area. You can get larger pieces of the materials, maybe a couple of floorboards, you know, you, the wall color that you want to use, and, and some other, maybe the drapes that you're thinking about using and, and that fabric color, and start to look at it on a, an actual scale. Because one of the things that's very challenging for people when they're renovating is to really understand the impact of scale of materials on, on a space. And it just, you you get to a better point of understanding, uh, you know, through time and experience in, in doing it. Please continue with your list then. So lighting and lighting systems, this is definitely a huge point of, of discussion. Right now, obviously, all new lighting should be LED to start with. You know, one, you know, they are energy efficient, right? And they last a lot longer and they're fully uh, programmable and controllable. So there's no re real reason at this point to not use anything but LED lighting. And also with LED lighting, the options are extraordinary. And you can really create very different feelings in a space, even with the same lighting, because lighting can be programmable. You can have a you know color color connect lighting, which you can change the color temperature of the lighting. You can dim some of the lighting. You can vary what lights on at one point or the other and all of the and then also placement of the lighting so how the lighting is affecting materials or wall surfaces to you know inform the quality of the space and where you place it so you know if you're doing cove lighting that's indirect always i would recommend always when possible indirect light or reflected light is the best kind of light particularly for re residential applications so if you don't have strong down lights where you can at any point kind of see the light source that's just shining directly into your eye, it's just a, it's a much better experience of the space. Not It's not always possible, but there are a lot of available fixtures these days that give you various options to try to get to that. You know, under, count, uh, under cabinet lighting, inside cabinet lighting, cove lighting. And thinking about all of these types of possibilities and how they can be integrated into a space, particularly if you're doing kind of a obviously new construction, but if you're doing a full gut value add rehab, you can really think about uh, the lighting systems that you're using ahead of time and plan them accordingly into the space. And of course, you can spend a lot of money on it, but you don't necessarily have to spend a tremendous amount of money on it. Uh, and then from there, most lighting systems, not all, but, but most can be controllable. They can be controllable through the wall switch, or many of them actually can be controllable through an app, 
for example. There's some companies like Kasambi is one example. It's an Italian company. They make these small little devices that fit into junction boxes and they connect with a, with an app that they make. And so that goes in a junction box and then you can connect a whole group of lights to that box, to the Kasambi unit, and then you can control the lighting in that entire room through an app on your phone or your, or your iPad. You can set different moods for different times of day. You can have it come on. You know, there's a lot of amazing opportunities that exist uh, in lighting these days. Obviously, I'm getting excited about it because I, I, get, I get excited about lighting. What else is on your list? So building envelope, right? Building envelope is really of critical importance today. It can be more challenging with the value add rehab, but certainly in a new build, you have the you know full decision making uh, capability of what you do with your your building envelope. And in specifically when you're thinking about energy efficiency, the building envelope is is critical. You want to have the tightest and the best insulated building envelope, and and that's going to create the most comfortable space and reduce your energy costs dramatically, along with the windows that you're using in that, you know, the exterior of the building envelope. And I would always recommend at least double pane, but triple pane UPVC with a low E coating is is definitely, you know, the way to go. And there's a lot of options these days that are fairly reasonably priced. And I think anyone living in, a, in an apartment or a house with windows like that will really, really appreciate the difference. When it comes to the building envelope and controlling the temperature and the comfortability, is a lot of that dictated by code? Or can you go above and beyond code to really emphasize that? You can that? significantly go up uh, above and beyond code. So the, the, the envelope or wall section has an R value rating, and you can achieve a much higher uh, R value rating. This starts to get a little technical, but if you, you, you typically the wall gets a little bit thicker, but there's, there's certain types of insulation that you can use as well that will increase your R value. Closed cell spray foam insulation, for example, is terrific. It, it's interesting because there's you know, pluses and minuses with, with trying to do some of these things. That, that type of insulation is actually slightly toxic, but it achieves such a higher level of, of energy efficiency, it really offsets it and it will produce a, a much better building envelope. So there's tremendous advantages. And then also in that envelope to eliminate you know, thermal break bridges where cold or warm air is, is passing all the way to the interior. And when you do those things, which typically are not really required by code, you're gonna achieve a much tighter building envelope and then be able to have a much more consistently comfortable space in the interior that uses a lot less energy. Keep going with your list. That was building envelope. And the, and the last one is building systems, right? So of course, connected to the building envelope obviously is the building systems because this is a critical factor in, in all buildings. And there's a lot of advancement these days uh, with building systems, not just you know the appliances you have in your kitchen or in your laundry room, of course, those are much more advanced these days as well, but just in terms of the systems that are actually you know, heating and cooling your house. And to start off with, at the moment, it's possible to run everything electrically. You don't need to use natural gas or other types of fossil fuels. There's great systems that work with natural gas. The, what's, what's typical you know, where we're operating are mini split systems. It's kind of a, a heat pump system. And these are becoming much more prevalent, I think, you know, across the country here. They've been used in Asia for, for decades at this point. The heat pump mini split system? Yes, yes, exactly. And they're, they're economical, they're efficient, and they provide a lot of comfort as well. And you can get them with a unit that just fits on the wall or there are also ones that are, are concealed. The, the ones that fit on the wall are ductless. And so they're great for uh, renovation projects. So again, if you're doing a value add renovation, using those types of units, work really well. They're not, they're, you know, they're, they're not ducted. You don't have to deal with any of that. You can put the unit on the wall, put the other unit outside. And if you're in a more suburban area, very easy to do, very low cost. And in a lot of uh, places these days, you can get some tax credits for using those systems. So th that's, you know, one, for example, I mean, you can also add other systems to your house in terms of how you're uh, ventilating it, right? You can get a uh, proper ventilation system or heat exchange system that, that's, that's constantly moving fresh air through the house. 
So this is all like getting into discussion that's more along the lines of where some of the requirements and metrics are for passive house, which is another another topic. We can really get too technical there. But so we're doing new construction here in Grand Rapids. And we're using the heat pumps, which my understanding is that's one of the most efficient HVAC type systems you can have. Good choice. The other thing is, I know there's a lot of controversy about eliminating gas and natural gas from a a building and where it actually runs into like some conspiracy theories here. Oh, yeah. In Michigan? We we decided to go electric because a it's it's just easier to control and and there's you can get all your appliances to to run off electric, but we didn't want to spend the extra cost of running gas lines into all 120 units. Made sense economically. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, and for in in our market, you know, we have we'd have to bring another utility into the building and then accommodate that within the mechanical rooms in the cellar of the building itself. So that takes up that valuable cellar space, which can be used for something else. Then we have another another system into the building. And, you know, there's a lot of downsides to natural gas. It, it doesn't, at this point with the, the heat pump system, mini splits, it doesn't heat or cool any better. So you're not getting that efficiency. The one thing people talk about is that, you know, they like it for cooking. You know, so there's maybe some small argument there, but I think if you look at the benefits on the other side, and you can also get induction cooktops, which heat up extraordinarily quickly, and they're much safer. So particularly if you have young kids, you're not dealing with an open flame when you're cooking, you know, which often leads to burning food, burning things, creating bad smells. Then, you know, if you burn something, you've added carbon into your interior space, things that are not healthy. So induction cooktops eliminate those and they work well. So this, I think you're making the right choice. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, I am persuaded by the arguments against gas, even though I enjoy cooking on my gas stove. But now every time I turn it on, I smell it and I'm like, oh, am I, am I toxifying myself? But the one thing I think with my, my five point list that I, I didn't really hit on as much as I would typically like, because I, I really think about design from an aesthetic standpoint, is when you, the, the first three points on my list, the planning, spatial planning, materials, and, and lighting, there's really a very, very strong aesthetic component to thinking about those aspects of architectural design and particularly interior architectural design. And I would just encourage people to, you know, start some Pinterest boards. It's a great kind of social media app that's very image based and it's terrific for for architectural ideas and interior ideas. And then that's a way to kind of start to see what you like and what things look like together and then maybe print some of the some of them out. You can get some, you know, st- really starting with source images, right? It's very common in architectural design practice. We'll get some source images of different things that that you like and then start pairing those, again, from that kind of mood board standpoint with different things that you're attracted to, you know, that have the kind of feeling that you like. It might be a sunflower or a rose or a brook or some other photograph that you've taken that has a certain quality to it Put that on the you know source image board along with some design ideas along with some materials and start to see if that creates a a certain resonant quality and then you're starting to really dig into the design process so i'll say this i I think when you say it and you do it, it it probably makes sense because you have a background in design but most people myself included should not be the ones putting together the design for a, for a multi-million dollar building, you should hire someone who knows knows how to do it right. Because if I did it, no one would want to live there. The other point with that, that, that definitely is, is really valuable is that even if you can get to something where you kind of like what you put together, there's all the other layers of then taking, you know, that design inspiration and formalizing it into something that can be built. How does that inform, you know, what the kitchen and the kitchen design is and, you know, how the cabinets work and, you know, what are the elevations? You know, those need to be drawn and so someone can actually make them and, and build them. Uh, so there's real specifics that obviously get technical and get involved in the, you know, the actual language of the field. What does it mean to, to build the Tesla of houses? We're kind of actually talking about some some of it and going through this list. So, you know, a Tesla is there's, there's a. A combination of a couple of things that that I, I find really remarkable from a design standpoint, because 
the envelope in the interior of the car are beautiful. They're beautifully designed, in my my opinion. Certainly one could argue with this, but I think they're beautifully designed. But combined with that, they're it's utilizing technology from a design system standpoint to run the car and integrating both of those two things together. So you have that systems design, which is certainly when the company started was particularly advanced. Now there's other EVs out there combined with this really cutting edge visual design, all packaged together into one envelope. So you think about that and think about how that could be applied to you know residential architecture. And, and I think that when you think about what's possible with you know just some of the ideas, you don't have to build a to passive house standards, but when you start to think about what can be done, you know, in terms of a level of comfort that you can achieve and the quality of design that you can achieve, these things now are completely possible. You can have a house that you can build where you can consistently control the temperature, the interior temperature to exactly what you want at all times while you're bringing in and out fresh air from the space. So it's, you know, a complete recycling of fresh air at the temperature, creating a comfort level that feels great 12 months of the year, 24 hours a day. And then, so it's in, in that, it, to do that, you have to use some of these more advanced ideas of using, you know, triple pane, triple pane windows with low E coating, increasing the R value of the building envelope, and then in having the right mechanical systems. And then on top of that, to add to the similar thinking of a Tesla, increase the quality of the interior design so you have spaces that are completely comfortable and that also feel great to be in so you need to think through the design process as well within that and then you have a very advanced house or very advanced re apartment building that then also gives you that same quality and feeling that i think most people probably had the first time that they got into a tesla what is your favorite hack or app that's it i i think i would you know at the moment in thinking about design i would go back to pinterest because I, I think it's a, it's a great app for you know looking at uh, different possibilities with with design and i think it, it it can be useful for everyone tell our listeners how they can find out more about you or get a hold of you so you can visit our uh, website which is hivedevelopers.nyc or you can email me directly at aaron a a r o n at Hive Developers with an S dot NYC. So one or the other, there's a contact form on the website. I'd certainly love to have you come and check out some of the work we're doing and, and get in touch. And if you're interested, set up a call and we can talk about things more. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. I've been looking forward to this and talking about just how architecture and design really affect real estate, affect real estate investors like our listeners and giving us your five point list as to what to really pay attention to. And then talking about what does a Tesla of houses actually look like? It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much, Brian. I really enjoyed it. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. 